Welcome back to another online lesson. My name is Mr. Hoven, and if you remember from last time, we were talking about the Articles of Confederation. This was the first attempt by the newly freed states to govern themselves. And if you remember, last time we talked about the strengths and also the weaknesses, and there were plenty of weaknesses. And keeping in mind those problems that the people of the 13 states were facing, uh, after the revolution, the nation suffered an economic depression. And a depression is a period of time when business activity slows, prices and wages fall, and unemployment rises. So the depression hit farmers extremely hard. And this was caused by the Revolutionary War. Uh, during the war, the there was a high demand for farm products, so the farmers borrowed money for land, seeds, and animals and tools. However, when the Revolutionary War ended, demand for farm goods went down. Prices fell, farmers could not pay off their loans. And in Massachusetts, matters worsened when the state raised taxes. The courts started taking the farms of the farmers that could not pay, for, pay off their loans. And the angry farmers thought, we're being treated unfairly and we are not going to put up with this. So an individual named Daniel Shays, who was a Massachusetts farmer, fought at Bunker Hill and Saratoga, fought for his country. He organized an uprising in 1786. More than 1,000 farmers took part in Shays' Rebellion. They attacked courthouses and prevented the state from seizing farms. Eventually, the Massachusetts legislature sent in the militia, and it drove them off. This was a very important event because this rebellion was a sign that the Articles of Confederation cannot and will not work for the 13 states, and they must begin to explore other options. So, a constitution was called, and this was held on May 25th, 1787. It began in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The goal? Revise the Articles of Confederation. 55 delegates were sent to this convention. However, Rhode Island sent no one, and the reason for that was they didn't want to be a part of something that would overthrow the established government. They liked the way it was. They didn't want to hinder democracy. And they didn't want to sacrifice and give up their state power to a larger, more powerful central government. And at this convention were some of the brightest and most well-respected minds of that time period. There was George Washington, who was so well-respected that the delegates at once elected him president of the convention. Alexander Hamilton of New York. During the Revolution, Hamilton served for a time as Washington's private secretary, and he despised the Articles of Confederation. The nation, he wrote, is sick and wants powerful remedies. And this pr the prescription for this was a strong central government. There was also James Madison, and he was probably the best prepared delegate. He was 36 years old from Virginia. For months he had been reading books on history, politics, and, the co and commerce, and he arrived in Philadelphia and was ready to go. He came to play, and he was known today as the father of, of the Constitution. And to keep in mind, we've also ta been talking about Benjamin Franklin. He was much older at this time, but still was well respected for his knowledge of government and human nature. And all these minds began to craft what we know today as the Constitution of the United States of America. Soon after this convention began, the delegates realized that they would have to do much more than simply revise the Articles of the Confederation. They would have to write an, ent an entirely new Constitution which would completely change the way government was handled in the 13 states. And now that the delegates had agreed that they needed to create a constitution or government with a strong central government, the idea of representation came into play. How would states determine who would get more representation, or would it all be equal? So the first plan that was established or proposed to the Congress was the Virginia Plan, and this was proposed by Edmund Randolph and James Madison. And this called for a strong, centralized government with three branches. First, it would be the legislative branch would pass the laws, executive branch would carry out the laws, and the judicial branch, or system of courts, would decide that the laws were carried out fairly. Now, according to the Virginia plan, there would be a bicameral legislature, meaning there would be two houses, a larger house and a smaller house. This would where the representatives would debate important issues. However, seats would be awarded based on population. So in both houses, the states with the larger populations would have more representation. Therefore, they would be able to dictate how decisions went. This was very unfavorable for the small states because they had smaller populations. And they began to clamor for a different type of representation style. So in response to the Virginia plan, the New Jersey 
plan was created. And this was proposed by William Patterson, and he called for another strong national government with three branches, much like the Virginia plan. And he wanted just a unicameral legislature, which means there would be only one house in the government. And each state, regardless of population, would only get one vote. This would make everything equal, thus keeping the bigger states from controlling the government. So again, Virginia plan, based representation on your population, and New Jersey plan, wanted the representation to be equal. Now, for a while, no agreement could be reached, and temper started flaring, and it seemed like the convention, the convention would just fall apart and wouldn't be able to agree on anything. But finally, Rog Roger Sherman of Connecticut worked out a compromise that he hoped would satisfy both the large and the small states. Sherman's compromise called for the creation of a two-house legislature. Members of the lower house, known as the House of Representatives, would be elected by popular vote. As the larger states wished, seats in the lower house would be awarded to each state according on its population. So the House of Representatives is based on your population. And the upper house would be called the Senate. And this would be ch these Senate members would be chosen by state legislatures. Each state, no matter what its size, how big it was, would have two senators. And this part of the compromise appealed to the smaller states. So on July 16th, the delegates barely approved, but it was approved, Sherman's plan. And this became known as the Great Compromise. Again, House Representatives, based on population, makes the big states happy. The Senate, everyone's equal, two representatives, makes the small states happy. Another area that was hotly contested, and this was between northern and southern states, was should slaves be counted in the population to represent different states? So this, should they count slaves as part of the population when they're looking at how many representatives you ha have to the House of Representatives? Southerners wanted to include the slaves in the population, even though they wouldn't let slaves vote. And if slaves were counted, the southern states would control the House. Northerners objected. So they said, since slaves cannot vote, they should not be counted when assigning representatives. So once again, there was a compromise reached. They agreed that three-fifths of the slaves in any state would be counted. In other words, if a state had 5,000 slaves, 3,000 of them would be included in the state's population count. And this agreement became known as the three-fifths compromise, because they're counting three-fifths of the slaves' population as part of the entire population to decide representation. So now as these major compromises have been met, it came time to sign the Constitution of the United States. As the summer drew to a close, they were ready to make their decision. On September 17, 1787, the Constitution was ready to be signed. Opening lines of the preamble expressed the goals. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. One by one, the delegates came forward to sign the document. All but three of the delegates remaining in Philadelphia did so. Edmund Randolph, George Mason of Virginia, along with Eld Eldridge Jerry of Massachusetts, refused to sign. They refused. That they feared that the new Constitution gave too much power to the national government. The next step would be the Constitution called on each state to hold a convention to approve or reject the plan for new government. And once nine states endorsed it, the Constitution would go into effect. That about wraps things up for today. Hope you enjoyed it. Next time we'll be looking at the ratification of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. We'll see you next time.